Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to have you with us this evening. We'll just allow people to come into the webinar and then we'll get started. We've got a great team of presenters here this evening. By the foundation. So this is the webinar um, held by the Foundation for Common Land and on our SFI Moorland assessment work. So I think we'll get started now and then other people can come in um, as and when uh, they, they're ready. So good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be able to hold another webinar um, on SFI Moorland assessment. And this is thanks to the DEFRA ELM test and trial that the Foundation for Common Land has been running over the last 15 months. And uh, we're working closely with commoners and owners of common land across England. And we're going to have representatives here to tell us about the work they've been doing. We're also really delighted to have Janet Hughes with us this evening. And as some of you may have clocked, that there was a big announcement around SFI um, 2023 um, last week. And we'll be hearing a little bit about that and how that affects commons. And um, we're also going to be telling you about how you can um, take forward the SFI Morelands assessment through our digital app. So we've developed this app, started doing it through the test and trial, and now we're taking it forward to scale it up. So everyone on Moreland will be able to use it, whether on commons or on non-common Moreland. So before um, we um, just like to give a little bit of uh, housekeeping. So we've got a range of presentations that will be, um, we'll do, we're also recording this evening. So you will be able to, um, be able to listen to it again so don't worry about taking notes um, in terms of the webinar there's a chat function at the bottom of your screen and please introduce yourselves there we'd love to hear where you've come from and what your interest is we'll also be able to answer some questions at the end of the webinar we hope to have at least 20 minutes for questions so please use the question and answer um, feature that's again at the bottom q a and we'll be able to, uh, if you put questions in there, you can also upvote them by clicking the little thumb. If you like someone else's question, it'll then be more likely to be um, uh, asked. If you've got a techie issue, please put that in the chat and our tech support team will be able to help you there. Um, so without further ado, I think we will um, now get started. And to begin with, um, we'd like to run our first poll, Susie, if that's OK, because it's really great for us to understand who's here and what their interests are. So if you could please fill in the poll, you're allowed to answer um, more than uh, one if you fall into more than one category. Good, lots of farmers. One of the great things about SFI is the way it's being uh, designed is the idea is that farmers are able to support themselves both in the application process and in delivering the SFI. And that's something we've very much been working on with our test and trial. Is it farmer friendly? And we're, um, it, it, that's that's critical because we want to make sure you understand um, what the scheme requires. It's um, it's able you're able to deliver in terms of undertaking the Moreland assessment, and you're able to use the results for the future of your business. So here we go, and we've had most people respond so far. Excellent. So we've got here the. 59% of the people here are um, 59 people who answered that we've got farmers, a uh, couple of policy makers, 20 land agents, some farm advisors, seven common landowners, a few academics, and, and some of those here yeah, are, are secretary or chair of commons associations, because they're absolutely critical to making the SFI work on commons. So thank you very much. That's great. So now I'm going to do a little bit of a policy update. 
um, just so that we can um, see where we are. And then I'm going to ask, be asking Janet a few questions. So will I will share my screen and make sure we've I just have a little bit about what's going on. What's interesting about, um, you know, in terms of reassuring about the SFI um, Moreland on um, comments is that we've there's not a huge amount that's changed. So that's that makes life an awful lot uh, uh, easier for us this evening. But there are lots of new things happening um, overall. So SFI Moreland on Commons making it happen. And as well as having the support from the DEFRA um, for the, this ELM test and trial, where the Foundation for Common Land is also supported through our Auckland Commons by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And we're appreciative of their support as well. So this evening, we're going to be, um, say, a policy update, um, we'll chat with Janet, uh, we'll hearing about the test and trial findings. How do you undertake, how can you undertake the SFI survey, the next steps, and some reflections about um, how, what, what's going to be happening with more and going forward, and plenty of time then for your questions and answers, and answers from us. And so, I should add that ELM is very much still under development. So the government has taken, or the DEFRA have taken a um, iterative approach to this. So that means there'll be more updates in the future. So you know it's really important to keep an eye on what's going on. So last um, week, last Wednesday, uh, the there was a 156-page um, handbook uh, released by DEFRA, the Sustainable Farming Incentive for the 2023 offer. So we'll, um, we can put a link to this uh, in the chat, but it's available by Googling SFI Handbook 2023. Um, and there's, um, there are, instead of having standards, which are bundles of actions, DEFRA have now decided to have a series of 23 actions and people will be able to combine these in a way that's more flexible for their business going forward. As far as Moreland is concerned at the moment, there's only one action that relates to Moreland. So we'll um, looking at that. So if you're on, on a Moreland Common, um, that's the Moreland assessment. And um, if you're on a non moorland Common, there is the low input grassland standable action, I should probably say. So that's um, available for land that isn't in Moorland. And sometimes your common may be part Moorland and part not Moorland. Um, I should just add that anyone who's already in an SFI 22 agreement, they will be terminated. All those agreements will be terminated so that agreement holders can enter into the new SFI 2023. Um, and um, so people will be given notice for that and then they'll be able to go into the new scheme. The new scheme hasn't quite isn't available yet on rural payments. It will be available um, from August uh, 2023. There's a controlled rollout happening. So the great thing about SFI Moreland assessment is it, it is stackable with any existing high level stewardship or countryside stewardship that you may have on your land. The actual survey is designed to be undertaken by farmers. Um, and uh, the managers of uh, Moreland, you don't need to be a trained ecologist in order to do this. It will enable you to prepare for future ELM schemes and will also be underpinning future schemes going forward. There are some additional requirements for commons in terms of making sure all legal interests are consulted and involved, and there's an extra payment for that. We have a lot more information available on our website and there in the top right hand corner, you'll be able, if you click on the Common Land Toolkit, you'll be taken to our Common Land Toolkit. We have um, various windows you can go through and find out more about it or search there. So where um, and links to the government payments as well. So that's um, uh, all from me. Um, so now, Janet, um, be great to welcome you and uh, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you've got a really busy week with lots of shows going on at the moment. Yes. Um, so you're still it's in good London. To be here. Thank you for having me. Well, it, it's really, really lovely to see you. Um, and I know it's a very busy time. And that's why it's it's great to have this chance to be able to share what you're doing and um, what DEFRA is doing with um, 
farmers um, and those managing common land as we as we go along. So the first question that lots of people have been asking us is um, what does controlled rollout mean? People have been preparing for the SFI Moorland assessment. Some of them are just ready. You know, they were about to go into rural payments and click apply. So it'd be good to hear what does control rollout mean in practice? Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much for having me on the call this evening. And thanks everyone for dialing in. I've just realised my hair looks an absolute mess. Sorry about that. I've been here for quite a few hours already today. and <laughs> I'm getting to the messy hair stage of proceedings. Sorry about that. I don't mean to be rude by looking scruffy. Um, controlled rollout means that when we launch a new service of some sort, the way that we manage that is we ask people initially to contact the RPA to say that they want to apply. And then the RPA very carefully make sure that you get the support that you need and that we watch like a hawk to make sure that everything is working as you would expect and the reason we do that is because we know from the past that when you don't do that and things don't work as people expect you can cause all kinds of trouble we, don't, we absolutely do not want to have that happen here and I know from my experience in lots of different parts of government and different um, technology and service transformation roles that there is always something that you need to tweak that doesn't quite work exactly as you expected when you roll out a new scheme and we want to be able to have control over that in the first few weeks of rollout so it just means that the service will be open for people to apply um, but the route in will be initially that you contact the RPA and they will support you to apply and make sure that you get everything you, that you need and then we gradually that's kind of opening it with stabilizers on and we take them off as we get more confident and last time that took us a few weeks and we would expect that's what we'll do this time round. if you're on a common you're probably always going to need some degree of additional support from the RPA because as we know common is very complicated so the same is the case for you you contact the RPA and they will arrange for you to apply in the best way that's available at that moment in time and we work with common commons experts and farmers to make sure that the system is working for commoners and that we can make sure we've got the land properly loaded up and everything's ready for you and if you're already in an agreement we'll make it as smooth as we possibly can for you to transfer onto the SFI 2023 system um, and to be clear we're not expecting to do this every year this is a one-off because at this stage in rolling out the scheme we've had two years of the pilot now we've had the first year of rolling out the main scheme and that initial limited offer and we've learned a huge amount from that and there's quite a lot of improvements we want to make and we've made a decision to make a lot of improvements in one go as we introduce the 2023 offer so that we can make a big leap forward with it really to provide more flexibility, make the scheme more workable and more accessible and more attractive for farmers, but we're not expecting to do this again in terms of terminating agreements um, and, and asking people to transfer across. You will, you will just be in SFI from that point forward is the plan. That's really reassuring. Um, if people are in SFI 22 and some people entered last October, should they, they need to get on and do their survey, don't they? So you yes. still they, they, you still have to comply with the scheme as it is. So if people absolutely. haven't yet done their survey, they should be doing it this summer. Yes, That's absolutely. Good. So for as long as you're in your agreement, you need to comply with the agreement. And what we're expecting to happen is that people who are already in an agreement will want to transfer seamlessly into a new one. Um, and that's what we'll arrange for you to do. So you should carry on as normal. This is a kind of administrative transfer rather than a substantive change in what you're required to do. But what it does do is introduce the management payment for those who are in the Moreland Standard, um, where you get £20 a hectare for the first 50 hectares into, the, in, into an SFI agreement to cover some of the costs of taking part. And that's in addition to the payment you get for the action and for the commons payment. Um, and also there are some changes the rules to allow us to if we want to we put a rule in saying we can't change the terms and conditions without your consent which is quite right too um, however what we've discovered is that even if you want to change them in your favor for example to pay you more money we have to write to everybody and ask for your consent which is actually a pain for everybody so there's a few kind of minor tweaks like that to just make the terms and conditions work more effectively for all of you um, right. which will be part of the transfer and I noticed there's transparency about the terms and conditions. They are all in the back of the handbook. So one of the reasons the handbook is so long is because the terms and conditions are there and it explains how inspections are done. It explains about penalties, everything, everything's yes. included in this one document. Yes. And so that that's great. Um, in terms of um, the SFI assessment, it's going to be, a, is it, are we right and think this is going to be a sort of baseline and you'll expect people to continue to do this if they were to for instance to go into a scheme that required actions land management actions they would still continue to do this it's not like a one-off you would know this that's yeah. right it's an annual assessment and the idea is for you to make an initial assessment to see what's the current condition of the moorland and what are the opportunities for you to produce public goods on there um, and what are you already producing um, and then the idea is for you to, to repeat that annually and that's why it's an annual payment um, so that you can assess each year how things are changing and what the opportunities are to progress further. So you would yeah. continue doing it. If that's why we've made it possible for you to do it alongside existing agreements. And you'll be able to add more agreements as they come in for more than management um, in 2024. 
in, so do you know sort of when in 2024 or what those sort of how those will compare with the existing CSO HLS schemes on Moorland? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we published we published some information about this in the um, we published some indication in this in, in the in our document that we published in January, which I'll post a link to in a minute when I stop speaking. I can't do both at the same time, um, but I will post a link to that. We published a um, document in January which set out everything we're going to pay for in environmental land management schemes, and what when when each thing is going to be available and how much they'll be paid, um, and that included new actions for moorland, including peatland restoration and also um, moorland management type actions. We've been working very hard to develop those. We've been looking at a number of different ways of doing it. We've been testing that with with uh, moorland and upland farmers, and we expect to publish the full details of the new options in September, October this year, most likely October. Um, in a full kind of fully detailed here's the final payment rate here is here is exactly what you'd need to do to get those payments so we're not able to we're not quite ready to share that yet but we will do um, in september october and we obviously know that lots of people are very keen to see that information and wanting to know what their income opportunities are but in the meantime we have published some information about this with indicative payment rates um, and i'll post a link in the chat to um to that document in case anybody's not seen it Brilliant, Janet. Well, time's moving on. If it's all right, we're going to crack on with some of the presentations and we'll, we'll look forward to having another chat to you later on in the evening. Thank so you. thanks very much. No problem. So now we're um, going to invite um, Viv and um, Tracy. So Viv is going to start. So Viv Lewis is um, been uh, working as local facilitator on our test and trial project. And Viv is also the administrator for the Federation of Cumbrian Commoners and secretary of a large commons association. So she's really familiar with, um, with, with how commons work. So over to you, Viv. Thanks for joining us. Okay, can everybody hear me and see the screen? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. I just had a, a little question pick, popped up, which rather floored me. Um, thank you very much, Janet, and thank you, um, Julia, for the introduction. So Tracy and I, who are both the facilitators, are gonna take you through the Moreland assessment and what we've done. Um, so very quickly, moving on. Uh, right. Okay, so the, I mean, you I think quite a lot, I recognise quite a lot of the names on the participants and the attendees and um, well done for your fortitude for coming off to these test and trials. So you will probably know this already. Um, so this test, of, test and trial is managed by the Foundation for Common Land and there are three commons taking part. There's Brantford in Cumbria, Longmind in Shropshire and Peter Tavy in Dartmoor. And you can see on the map where, roughly where they are. The DEFRA is paying the association exactly the same payments as they will get in the in, in if they did SFI more than for real. Uh, but they've also got a common, they've got a local facilitator who is helping in the test and trial. So that's the site difference. Um, and here are the more assessment payments, which Janet already has helpfully told us. And there is this twenty pound per hectare up to. Up um, to uh, if we can't, when the screen, the slides aren't moving on. All right, you could go sorry. to presenter mode, perhaps, to click on in, the... I am in presenter mode. Oh, it's showing us, it's just showing us... Um, what is it showing you? It's just showing the title. We can only see the title. So if, oh, how weird. Sorry about that. Maybe uh, on the wrong screen, sometimes they... Um, yeah. I'm going to end show and start again. Can you see it if I move it on now? Yeah, it is on the wrong screen. That's what it's on your wrong screen. You need to drag it to your other screen where you are. Weird. I can always open it for you if you like. Yeah. How's that? Is that any different? Uh, no. Um, we, I'll... Um, Viv, if you just stop sharing your screen on Zoom, okay, yeah. thank re you. Uh, Reshare screen two rather than screen one. Right. So double click, double click on the, the screen that shows the full. Yeah, screen. I know, but when I look at screen two, I'm now lo not looking at it. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I can share it if. Okay. Yeah, I'll... apologies. I'm sorry. Apologies for this. Okay. 
accident. Um, so, okay, we should, I will share that. Right. Okay. Thank you, Julia. So presumably you can, will you be able, you have to move it on now? I'll move it on, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, very briefly, um, these are the moorland payments and the new thing is the £20 per hectare uplift for up to uh, 50 hectares, and it's a three-year agreement. Move it on, Julia. Okay, so what do you have to do to do the moorland assessment? Basically, there are three activities. First is the survey the moorland to identify and record the soil and vegetation. This is, the, this is where the app comes in, and we'll be talking more about that. Once you've done the survey, you use the data to assess the condition of the public, and pub, public goods. And these are carbon storage and capture, flood mitigation, clean water and biodiversity. And after you've assessed them, you identify opportunity to maintain, enhance and restore your public goods. And these, these um, the activities two and three would be done with the whole association or those who have signed up to the SFI. So it, it takes meetings and discussions. Can you move it on, please? Yeah. Okay, getting ready to apply for SFI assessment. Before you apply, though, you have to have certain things in place. You must have a commoners association or a single entity. Um, the SBI and field parcels. Now, certainly, your most commons will have this. You're already in schemes. If you're not in a scheme, these are things that you'll need. You'll need a bank account. You need to demonstrate that you have sufficient management control for three years and also an enforceable internal agreement. Move on. So what does sufficient management control mean? It means that you need to get, first of all, for most commons don't really have the registers up to date because sufficient management control requires contacting everyone on the register and telling them that the association in, intends to apply for SFI. That means writing around to everyone, demonstrating that you've made an effort to contact everybody. Uh, Julia? So creating a live register. Now this can be, for some, this can be quite a big job, but hopefully for most commons, you're more or less up to date. But what you need to do is start with the official register and then of your common and then transpose the register to an Excel spreadsheet. You do that so you can actually work with it and, and manipulate it, the data. I mean, you know, otherwise you've just got large sheets of paper and it's very hard to do anything with it. And with the Excel spreadsheet, you can then sort the data and also send out letters to valid entries. Um, and as you'll see, and I hope that most of you are familiar with sort of registers of commons, <clears throat> that there's a lot of the early, a lot of the early registers, because these, these went into the registers in you know, the early, late 1960s, 1970s, a lot of them are now out of date and being crossed out, as you can see in the example. You can find Excel templates in the common land toolkit, so, and there's, there's a lot of guidance on how to do it. It's, it's quite a, you have to be, you know, it's quite, it's quite a long job and you have to be good at trying, you know, uh, recording data and transferring it across. There are people who really enjoy this sort of work and I'm sure you'll be able to find someone to do it for you. Can you move on, Julia, please? So, to, for example, um, you know, getting registered up to date. Uh, of the three commons, Dartmoor already has a live register because of, of Dartmoor has a commons council and that, that, so they didn't have to do anything. On Brant Fell, now Brant Fell is, is a common that actually was in a UELS scheme. And when the US scheme ended in 2017, they didn't go into any other scheme. So basically the, the association was a bit moribund and we had to sort of almost start again. We found that there were 276 entries on the register of which 148 of these entries were valid, the rest were canceled and, and replaced. But out of these 148 entries, 68 were actually rights holders because they often had multiple entries in the, in the register. 
So it took a bit of sifting and sorting to get to our 68 right hold, rights owners, which we sent out the letters to. A long bin didn't to compare, it had a slightly smaller common and it had 254 entries, 190, oh, sorry, 129 were valid and there were 110 rights holders. So as you can see, it's a reasonably good, a big job because you know for Brown, we had to write round to 68 people and for Long Mind, we wrote round to 110 people. And when we wrote round to them, we included a table of the rights that we thought they had according to the register so they could check them and correct and amend them. And I got at Brown, we got 30 responses back with corrections. Um, it was more around not necessarily correcting the register, but often people were tenanting rights from somewhere else. And so we, you know, again, because often because the Commons register doesn't tell you everything. Um, in Longmin, they had 41 corrections, but the templates are available. So it does take a bit of work. Um, and I don't know, Tracia, are you able to talk? Tracy's having problems with her internet and we were going to, she was going to do this bit, but I, Tracy seems to have disappeared and I can't hear her. Okay, well, I'll carry on. Um, I apologize, I apologize for this. Um, uh, you need a model internal agreement for the SFI. And this is an agreement between the Commoners Association, the individual members and the owner. And the internal agreement you know, must have certain clauses. It has to, you know, the clauses about what is expected of the participants and how they get paid, um, how payments will be distributed, payments for undertaking the survey work, what is required of members and how the disputes will be resolved. As part of this, um, test and trial, the Foundation for Common Land has paid a solicitor to draw up a model internal agreement. And that again is on the toolkit, but the, clearly there are, you know, it comes with a health warning that you have to make it appropriate to your common. You cannot just take it as it is and just fill in the gaps. You really need to look at it. Next one. Um, now, what we had, we found it quite interesting um, and had quite a lot of debate, certainly on Brandt, about who eligibility criteria to join the SFI Moreland. When we wrote round to, um, what we found there was a lot of, quite a lot of people who had moved into the area and bought a field and had a few rights. Often they didn't actually reply to our letters anyway. And um, talking to the Commoners Association, we wanted to make sure to a large extent that the money went to the active farmers or the, the, or the uh, and graziers. So we decided, and this is up to each uh, um, association, it's not to exclude anyone, but we were finding that actually some people were almost like self-excluding themselves by not responding because they didn't really know anything about commons or whether they even had commons rights. So we decided that, um, that to join the SFI Moreland, you'd have to have, be a, have a SBI, a single business identifier, which indicates that you actually are farming. You would have to agree to become a member of the um, Commons Association and um, abide by its constitution. In our case, we decided they would have a minimum of 50 grazing rights, in fact, those were most people were not grazing the common below um, 50 grazing rights and people were happy about that. Clearly, you have to say that you're going to be able to attend meetings because, um, you know, as part of this, the sort of actions two and three is all about attending meetings and coming to agreement about the condition of the public goods and also things that you can do to make, improve them. And also to assign the internal agreement for entry into the SFI. But these need to be adapted to your circumstances, your common. And this is just an example that we came up with um, for us and Long Mind. I can see Tracy. Are you able to talk, Tracy? I'll do my best. I keep Excellent. dropping in and out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so also what you need to set out in your internal deed is obviously how to divide up the money. And there's various different ways to do this. So once again, there was quite a lot of discussion about how to do this amongst the commoners and amongst um, Viv, Louise and I. And we came up with that for the, um, we'd do £6.15 for the administration, which is the additional payment you get for being a common. Um, 
this sounds quite a lot of money, but there's a lot of work in the first year setting up the register and doing all of that work. Um, there's also a payment for the owners if you're paying them. Obviously, that has to be negotiated. Um, for the surveyors, we set the rate at £30 per point per year. Um, that seemed to be reasonable for people. For attending meetings, um, you can either pay, you, well, you can pay for attending meetings, you can pay per meeting, or you can pay for attending a percentage of the meetings in each year. Um, yeah, it, it's up to the each association how they do this. We also put in a general contingency fund, so that was to be held as a reserve, and then, you know, you could top it up if you, if you need to each year, or if you don't use it, it can just sit there, but that's just for anything untoward that crops up. Um, then we put in that at the end of each year, any remaining unspent money would be paid out to the members, and there's a lot of discussion as to who you pay it to, do you pay it to all the members, do you only pay it to the ones who've taken part in discussions and been actively involved. Um, also then, if you are paying the members, how do you pay them? Do you, you can pay them on a pro rata basis, depending on the number of members, so just literally the number of members get the same payment, or else you could do it by the number of rights held. Um, by each member, um, you, you know, there are different ways of doing it and you just have to work out what is the best for your common. Um, so once you've signed, are you going to do this now, Viv? Shall I carry on with this, Tracy, or do you want to talk to Colin first? Um, should we talk? I'll talk, I'll talk to Colin, seeing as I'm actually here. Yeah. Before I get kicked out again. Okay. So once you've signed up for the SFI you, with DEFRA, you then need to start doing the surveying. So when under the test and trial, we developed the app, which you'll hear more about in a minute. Um, but I also tried doing some on paper and I did. So I, I worked it, I got the maps from Magic, the, um, the DEFRA mapping system, because they've got a 10 hectare grid on. You've then got to print the maps off, draw the dots on there, give them their individual ID. Um, you've then got to go out on the common and work out where you are according to the physical attributes on that map and what's on the ground. Then I had to create a form with the questions and the possible answers on and another form to record the data on. So I actually found it a very laborious process and using the app was far easier because the app, the, it generates the points for you. It's got a GPS function that guides you to where you, to, you, to each of your points. All the questions are on it. You just scroll down the screen and answer them and then it automatically uploads it all. Um, onto land app. So I found the app far better to use than the paper. But we've got a commoner here who actually did some surveying on Peter Tavy Common. So I'll introduce you to Colin Abel. Hello, yeah, I'm uh, Colin Abel, Chairman of Peter Tavy Commerce Association uh, and also Chair of the Forest of Dalmore Commerce Association, which has 280 members plus um, about 11,000 hectares in total. Um, so we picked the easier option of doing it on Peter Devi, but there's only about 30, 35 actual commoners right in, in the register. Um, I farm Dartmoor with my two brothers, uh, with cattle, sheep and ponies that run across the uh, vast, vast majority of Dartmoor. Uh, what else do I say? But the SFI, um, it was uh, an experience. Um, technology is, uh, is, is the main key to it. Uh, I did find that a lot of the youngsters, um, which is a big plus, were getting more involved. We had a lot of youngsters doing the actual surveying. They seem to know how to work their phones better than what I can, um, technology-wise, um, and they uh, yeah seem to grasp it very quickly. Um, I was quite yeah I was quite pleased that we are moving in that technology along this way, as paper you know is is especially up on the common doesn't last very long. You know we've done counts in the past on paperwork, and yeah, time we get back home again. 
you can already read, read your paper. So it's definitely a step forward. It's just getting the technology to work uh, in the landscape that you're in. You know, we did have difficulties when we were trying to log in and actually recording the sites. You know, on the phone it says we hadn't, they hadn't logged in, but when you get back to base, yes, they were already on there and they could, and they could be retrieved. So yeah, big plus on that front on the technology. Yeah. yeah, so you've found the app actually quite easy to use. No, I did, yeah. I went out with my wife in one direction and sent my daughter in a different direction. And yeah, we met back, back at base kind of style and, and um, had a big debate on it. Um, yeah, and it was quite practical and easy to use, you know, come the end. Yeah. yeah. So would you like to have surveyed Peter Tavey without it? Uh, definitely not. Going forward, I think this is the only practical option. Like I say, guess guess the you know the, the youngsters seem to be more enthused with it. Um, as we all know nowadays, they they spend most of the time on the phone, pushing buttons and staring at the screen. So, um, you know, and also you know for young commoners coming forward, you know, there's many of their dads that turn up to the meetings and 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 the boys. But um, yeah, it, actually getting youngsters on the seats and and getting interested is probably the biggest plus so far. Yeah. So we're sort of looking at the. Th when you're actually working out who's going to do the surveying, um, what sort of skills do you think people need to be able to do carry this out? Um, well, I suppose the main one is actually you know, working your way around the apps, um, downloading the information before you start. Um, you know, something I <laughs> I'm not really savvy with, so yeah, I get the wife and the and the daughter to do all that, and then go out on the common and and, and um, yeah, actually physically going through it. And then it do the more like everything. The more, more you do it, the easier it becomes. And like I say, it's a process we're going to have to do for two or three years in a, in a row. So yeah, the more information we get, the better you know the statistics will be to show what the state of the common is in. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I know you know we've been to, we when we were setting up getting the people to do the surveying, we ended up with all people all commoners who were knew the common, and so sort of talking with the other people involved in this we came we're saying that you really need it to be people that know the common and have experience of traveling out there um and being able to to have the knowledge to get around to find crossing places and to be safe out there well exactly you know the you know the terrain that people would have traveled over and the knowledge of the crossing points on rivers and streams and that you know is a big advantage so therefore you know the local local man on the ground is probably best place to do all this this work um you know Peter David we had you know 100 points to to assess and we divide it between five five or six of us uh, or divide it on the map and that yeah people have done it at different times you know some people had to be coerced into going out and doing it actually doing it because we did do it during the middle of the winter this wasn't the best time um yeah. but yeah this but when you know we're literally looking to think of putting the forest into it which, which then would have to be 1100 points um based on that we'd need about 50 get 50 people involved you know, it just starts to, to escalate and uh, more management will be needed to try and get that that, that common into the scheme. So, yeah, that's, that'll be interesting to see the way forward on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think um, Peter Tavey will go into SFI proper now? After I think so. Yeah. I can't see the, you know, no reason why not to. Um, uh, engagement is probably the biggest the biggest thing at the moment is trying to get people to see the benefit of being involved in it. Um, you know, people that's doing the actual assessments can, you know, they learn more what's on the ground and what's under their feet and the opportunities. It's then trying to pass that information on to the rest of the membership and see, you know, they can get involved as well. That's probably going to be the biggest step of getting bigger engagement with the rest of the association. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, thank you for that. Um, okay. Do you want to carry on, Viv? Yes. Can I have the slides back, Julia? Thank you very much, Colin. And just to say that the Brant fell commoners are also thinking about signing up for SFI for real now. Uh, one of the things we did, do, we did is we did actually a survey, a survey of the surveyors um, because we wanted to know how they felt about it and it was anonymous so they could say what they liked. Um, and we got 21 responses, I think out of 23 res uh, surveyors altogether. Um, and so the, and I'm, I'm just giving you a, just a brief run through of some of the things they said. For one, of the, for one of the questions we asked is how they travel, what's on the common majority. Um, well, there was a mixture, really, mainly quad, um, mainly water in a mixture. 
Um, and it's interesting because people, you know, I was of the impression, oh, if you go on your quad, quad bike, it could take you, you could do it, do it all a lot quicker, but also so much depends on the, the lie of the land and the terrain, because sometimes the quad bikes, you actually have to get drive around further if you have it going up and down rather than, you know, you, you could walk up and down um, a valley and with the quad, you have to go all around, around the top and back down the other way. So it isn't always dead obvious which is going to be quicker. Now, how long did it take you to do a sample? Well, the majority seem to think it that's the actual sampling itself, not the you know getting to the next sample. Um, it seemed to be between sort of uh, 10 and five minutes. Um, and I think people got faster as they went along. Um, okay, and so the next one is, was it straightforward to decide which answer to choose from the drop down menus while sampling? Yeah, um, we haven't, um, I think you've, um, some of you have been on the calls will have seen them before the, um, these webinars, but we'll go into more detail um, in the next presentation. 81% um, said yes, I mean it's a small sample, and 19% no, and these are some of the comments. Um, one of the comments was about the sort of GPS signal and often, it, you know, it was um, quite often to find, the, to get to the point, depending on the weakness of the signal. Uh, but um, they generally found the drop, you know, sort of filling in the drop down box form quite easy. But we also found that there was actually some things missing on the drop, uh, on the um, drop down boxes which we would quite like to add in terms of the types of vegetation especially around mineral soils and the difference between mineral and peat soils um, another person said it was difficult to start but uh, start with but it got easy as it went along I think people most people found that and also some people had difficulties in deciding which land description to use because it didn't actually match their common very well and that's a problem with a very sort of general survey and I think that Another issue that I might have actually is consistency between surveyors. Um, but maybe if you get the same surveyor doing the same area each year, then at least they're consistent with themselves. Can you move on, please? We, uh, as Tracy said, we gave them 30 pounds per point plus VAT. And did you find the payment was over generous, about right and poor value? Well, nobody thought it was over generous and most people felt it was about right but some people thought it was poor value because they had to you know they seemed to have well they had to go a long way to to do their points so here are some of their comments and they're pretty obvious you know they said i felt it was fair but on on poor it's poor value on different difficult terrain and you know, if you've got very rocky stony outcrops and you can walk there and it's very steep it's going to take you a lot long a lot longer to get to the points but in some cases, you could make money very quickly and easily. I mean, on average, people were doing like three points an hour, which is 90 quid an hour. And for farming, that's quite a good hourly rate. Um, and someone said, if all the points could be reached by vehicle, then uh, the 30 pounds would be ample. One of the things that we decided at Brant Fell is to pay 30 pounds a point, but also then have a sort of to be flexible and, and people could get a bonus if they thought that, um, and, and this would have to be discussed amongst the members and the surveyors, if they thought that some people were actually, you know, it was taking them a lot longer. So this is to be negotiated and it's all part of the learning that, you know, a one size fits all price isn't necessarily right, depending on the terrain. Um, next one, and this is the last one. Knowing what you'd know now, would you choose to do the survey again? And the, the majority said yes, and or maybe if time. And I definitely time is one of the issues. Um, I mean, they would certainly go and do it on their own commons again. And one or two people were then thinking about they might go and do other commons. But listening to what Colin said, and then people were thinking, well, I don't really know the other commons very well. It could take me a lot longer. Will it be, you know, will it be worth my while? Um, so initially we were thinking there might be a little business for surveyors, but we're not quite sure about that. Um, and then these are things that both Colin and Tracy mentioned, um, you know, when surveying in the wind and rain, phones don't like it. And that is problematic because we were doing it in the winter. Um, and, you know, it's a, you know, I'm sure you all know when you're out on the common and it's raining and you know, the screen gets wet, it's very hard to do. So really, this is a fair weather, good weather job to make it work. Um, works well, but does require signal for GPS. Um, and some at some places there weren't, you know, the signal sort of went, so it was a bit difficult. Um, someone said if it helps making a contribution to helping the environment, I'm definitely interested in continuing. 
And then I think as both Tracy and Colin said, it's definitely better than a clipboard and pen. So can I, this is a plea to DEFRA and the DEFRA, the guidance on Gov UK. Um, I think that's the only way you suggest we do it, but I will be corrected if I'm wrong. Um, and that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the, you know, the slight technical hitches we had. That was absolutely great with Tracy and Colin. Thank you so much. I think it's important to, to distinguish between signal for GPS signal and phone signal. You don't require phone signal or Wi-Fi. You just there's there should be GPS everywhere. But what we find is that GPS signal can vary from place to place, but it's you don't require phone signal. So we've explicitly chosen apps that don't require that. Um, so now um, what we'd like to do now is to um, move on quickly. That's all right to um, Ben. So Ben Harris from the Land app, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the technology behind what we do and how you, you can both collect your data and use the data to make ensure you meet the um, requirements of the scheme. So Ben, it's lovely to have you with us and working with the Foundation for Common Land. And I know you and Dan have been, been great at collaborating with us. So over to you. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm just going to give a bit of a preview um, and a look at uh, the tech side of things when it comes to the survey tool that Land App and FCL have uh, made together. And hopefully you can see that it's pretty straightforward. So it starts off uh, with building a boundary. You then get your survey points. You can conduct the survey and finally you can visualize the results. And that will all be either on Land App or the survey app. So starting on Land App, which uh, you may have seen before, you want to uh, open up a new map and the process will look something a little bit like this. Try and talk over it, maybe speed it up a little bit. So you um, have to use Section 4 Common Land or the RPA integration on the Land App in order to access your boundary. You can then copy that into an SFI more than template. Um, after that, you can quickly allocate your surveyor sections by using the uh, easy drawing tools, uh, splitting up sections uh, and naming them for the uh, appropriate surveyor. You can then go ahead and collaborate with Foundation for Common Land by adding them to your map. Um, uh, and you'll end up with something like this, which you can then uh, use to generate your survey points, which is all done uh, by the FCL for you. Uh, that will end up with uh, your own uh, map where you can have all of your survey points, uh, which are auto-populated. So in this mobile app, uh, it uses the official SFI Moreland template for the survey. Uh, you can uh, use the locate feature, which was mentioned earlier by Tracy. You get a Google Maps and a grid reference provided for each point and uh, you also get progress tracking by each point turning blue once you've completed the survey and you can finally do uh, some photo evidencing. So this looks uh, like this. Um, your, your different areas of the survey are co uh, color coded so you know uh, if it's the uh, right survey area that you're in. So you can then click on a point and then you get your grid reference and Google Maps link. You can then click the uh, edit in order to bring up the uh, whole survey. Uh, after that, you've gone through all the questions. You can uh, add a photo uh, like so. And then finally, the points will turn blue to let you know that that point is completed. Then you get a very nice uh, looking map uh, which will be uh, done for you by FCL, uh, and you can uh, you'll probably be invited to the Land App uh, map in order to be able to see your results. And this would be for the following at attributes: surface roughness, peat depth, and ground cover. Um, yeah, so that's generally what the process will look like. We're super pleased with how the beta test has gone with FCL. Uh, as obviously we want as many people to try and uptake the SFI more than as possible. Uh, so for 2023, this functionality that you saw in the app is not in-house. Um, it's using that beta mobile app, but in 2024, we're hoping to get that functionality uh, in the Land app mobile as well. 
so yeah that's all for the tech side of things Thanks very much, Ben. That's absolutely great. And uh, so what we're doing is that we want to get this going as quickly as possible. At the moment, anybody who uses the Land App mobile app, it does require mobile phone signal or um, Wi-Fi in order to function. So we're using an app called Mergin, and uh, that's um, what we're using now. And um, we're Tom Lawrence, who's working with the Foundation for Common Land, and he's our coordinator for the SFI modern assessment and he'll take you through um, uh, what support we can offer you so over to you Tom. Okay perfect thank you very much Julia and thank you everyone who's been speaking so far so I'm just gonna uh, share my screen so you can see my presentation. Uh, let's get that away. Okay hopefully can everybody you can see that all right it's in the right mode yes tom that's great okay perfect so yeah i'm just uh so yeah ben was talking about the technical side of things so now i'm talking a bit more about uh the app and basically the service that the foundation uh for common land uh offer so you've already why is it slide uh, here we go so you've already heard this uh from viv about what the assessment is so you're surveying a number of things on your moorland and that's doing one point uh, every uh, 10 hectares uh, over the three years. So different points within the 10 hectares. Uh, but as Janet's mentioned at the start, that's likely going to underpin a lot of things going forward. So it's going to continue uh, into the future. And it gives you really a chance to you know, evaluate uh, the public goods and identify the opportunity to deliver further public goods uh, on your land, be it common or non-common land. Fits in with the tagline public money for public goods. Everything that you're recording goes into these five categories. So keep carbon, capture carbon, slow the flow, keep water clean and niches for species. And the different options that you select are broken down into things that you're already providing, the opportunity to enhance and the opportunity to restore. So how to do the assessment with Foundation for Common Land, as is the you know, theme of SFI, the idea is it's something that's super simple, our whole goal is to make this, you know, through this app as easy a process as possible. We really want the people who are, you know, out walking the land every day, working on the land, managing the land, to just as easily be able to go out and do the assessment as someone with a, you know, a PhD in ecology. The goal is, you know, empowering commoners, you know, people on common land and non common land to be able to get out, you know, as Colin mentioned, it's a chance for you to you know, get to know your land even better and get paid to do it. So I can't really see anything wrong uh, with that. Certainly it's also uh, an agreement uh, scheme that, you know, we've seen it's brought, you know, a lot of uh, commons together because the S5 Moreland is an action that's got nothing to do with stock. It's not sort of, well, where are we going to reduce the stock here or this or this or that? It's got nothing to do with stock. So we've actually seen a lot of cohesiveness with a lot of commons association because it's just talking about how we're going to go out, walk our land and see what we have on our land and get the data to do that. So we've developed this tool alongside the land app, uh, which has been, you know, through the test and trial that Viv and Tracy were talking about. As Ben mentioned, it's a combination of the land app on your desktop and then Mergin on your phone. These are both free to use and we use Mergin in the field because you can use that outside of phone signal. What's the charge for our service? Well, it's 60p per hectare plus VAT per surveying year. Um, a few questions that we've had in the past is, is this charge to the surveyor? That is not, that would be charged to the single entity. So be it your commons association or whatever form your single entity would take. Uh, we're really pleased with how the app is going and we're actually currently trialing a farmer led habitat assessment uh, that we can hopefully build on top of this. So. We've got two projects going on right now where um, Dan and Ben, they're building some extra stuff onto the app. So we're going to have the farmers in this area go and do a more detailed assessment of the habitats that they have. So this is currently being trialed right now, will hopefully be incorporated into the future. So if that's something that your uh, area would be interested in, then that's certainly something uh, to think about. Our initial plan when we launched the app was to work with sort of 15 commons 
sort of to manage the workload and then expand it out uh, to uh, nationally. But this has changed slightly with the recent announcements on SFI. So we know that you know for a number of our commons uh, that we're going to be working with, they currently don't have an agreement. So with the control rollout in August, it'll be a little longer before some of them get an agreement. And we know we met a few people at our events uh, that we had in Dartmoor and Cumbria over the last couple of weeks who said that they had got their agreement last October and they haven't done anything. Potentially, some of you might be on this call. So we've slightly uh, changed our focus and we're now really opening it up to those who are in SFI more who already have an agreement. You know, we're still going to be working with those commons and people that don't have an agreement, but really trying to help those who are both on common and non-common land to get their uh, surveys done because as has been mentioned, their agreements will be canceled. So we don't want anyone being in a situation where, you know, in a couple of months, uh, they're going to be uh, in trouble because they haven't uh, done the work. So after I talk, I'm going to put a link to a form where you can register your interest in the app. And certainly in there, there's a note section, anything we should know about. If you're in this situation, please let us know because we really want to uh, speed things up. As I mentioned, we had those four events and it was fantastic we had well over 100 people across those events and we got a lot of good engagement and a lot of advice uh, on the app so we've actually been you know making some recent changes to it because as i mentioned we want to make this as easy for people to use as possible so what will we do um we will invite you to a webinar that we've had where we demonstrate things you obviously have access to this webinar uh, after the event uh, so we might invite you to a live webinar i'll send you a recording of a previous one there's lots and lots of training material on all aspects of how to do the surveying from land app to merging, all those things. So you don't have to remember everything that uh, Ben just showed you just now. There's lots of training material, there's training videos, uh, everything you might need. We'll obviously create the points uh, for you uh, to do S by more. So there's an example right here, of how it would look uh, on your phone. We'll upload these points to Mergin uh, and then we basically, so we have it on our merging workspace, and then we would basically give you access uh, to that uh, to that project. So in this one, they divided they divided up into six different surveyors. So all of those surveyors will have downloaded merging onto their phones for free, and then we basically you give us your username or your email, and then we share that project with you. You download it, and straight off uh, into the field. So once you've completed everything. Uh, we'll download all the data for you, uh, so it can be imported into a mapping package, either back into Land App or another package if uh, you choose to, you know, use that. Um, there's photos that Ben mentioned that you can take in the app, so those photos come along with it. One thing that we've adapted in the test and trial, the photos weren't taken in app; they were taken just on your phone, and it was telling you sort of 20 miles away from where you actually were, and that was an issue with both Apple and Android. Uh, so the photos are now attached to those points. Of course, we'll provide assistance and technical support throughout the entire process, emails, calls, Zooms, really whatever you need. And then we'll present that survey data for you. You'll have access to, you know, the data is yours. So we'll give you back, obviously, all that data and you'll have access to it the entire time as a CSV or Excel document and in a geospatial form. So an example of that, this is an example of a recording tool where you could get some information. But really, if you were just looking at this and trying to work out what you're going to be doing with your common going forward, there's not really much you can glean for that. So that's why we have created these maps. So this is really, you know, anybody could look at uh, these maps and know, OK, we've got an issue, you know, in this part of the common or this area or this area. And maybe we need to look at some peatland restoration there or you know any other sort of project you might have so by having these maps you can target you know what areas you need to target and you will get basically updated versions of these maps each year that you're in the project so those will get finer and more granular uh, over the years and certainly you know with this likely continuing well into the future if you continue to use the service you're going to have very very detailed maps uh, of your area uh, if in case anyone's noticed, it did get brought up that um, not to use red and green for people that are red, green, colorblind. So we have taken that note into, uh, we have thought about that if um, someone's thinking about that right now. So what do you need to do? 
you need to sign the contract. We have a contract with a lot of terms and conditions, uh, a lot of information uh, in it. And the payment, it's 50% at the start and then 50% once you've completed the survey for you to be able to access those maps. You need to create the map of the boundaries. So just like Ben showed you, you need to create those maps in Land Up yourself. There's no point us doing it. No one knows your land better than you. And you know if you're a common and you have multiple people going out to survey, it's much better that you guys decide how you want to divide it up and do the division. If there's an issue, you know, obviously we can help with that. But you should be deciding where, how you're going to split up the surveying. Um, and then that's how we basically run it through uh, the program. Of course, you need to undertake and complete the survey on the ground. That is uh, not part of the service uh, that we offer. Of course, as I mentioned, all the data is yours. Uh, we have explicit language in the terms and conditions about how you, know, you own the data. The whole idea is we're making this easier for people to collect the data. So they're more empowered. They know more about what's on their land. So then if someone you know, comes in the future and says, we think you should do X, Y, and Z with your land, you can say, oh, yes, we agree with that because we've you know, seen this data. Or we disagree because from the data we've collected, you, know, just, you already know a lot about the land that you work on and live on. But this just puts it into you know, a written down form. So you need to be able to store that data and all the photos once it's been transferred to you. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the creation of land app and merging accounts, which are both free. So what can you do now? You can register your interest on our form and I'll be putting that in the chat for anybody uh, right after I finish speaking. If you're in a common, there's a lot of work as Viv mentioned before you can apply to SFI with the internal agreement, contacting everyone uh, on the rights register. It can take quite a lot of time. So you know, if you're sure that you wanna uh, go into SFI more than Start that work now. It's a you know a period before applications are open. It's a perfect time to get to do that. And then of course discuss you know the app with your association and decide whether you want to do it uh, or not. Obviously we hope you say yes, but you know you're not forced to. Um, and then yeah, if you have any questions, uh, this is our email. So SFI at foundationforcommonland.org.uk. So yeah, email us with uh, you know any questions you might have about anything. We want people to be as informed as possible before signing up to the app or anything. So we want people to feel as comfortable as possible. So yeah, hit us up with any questions. And that is the end. Okay, stop sharing. That's absolutely brilliant, Tom. So thanks so much to um, you and uh, to Ben for that. And I promise Tom isn't working on commission, even if he's very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we um where we've now um we've got gathered some questions already quite a few questions in the chat and we will come to those in the meantime so please remember to put your questions in the chat um it, because of the webinar format we won't be um we, we people don't uh, speak the participants so pop them in the chat and we'll answer any questions we can but i thought it it um at this stage i'd like to ask janet to come back on on screen um and i think maybe janet i know we've been you and i meet every few weeks and we update you with how the test and trials been going but i just wondered it's perhaps the first time you've seen the whole thing presented and just to be nice to have your initial reactions and, and how you feel about it that's brilliant. Thank you for the opportunity to come back on that. I, I think this is my heart singing because it's exactly what tests and trials are for, to find out in a farmer led way what works, what doesn't work, what do we need to do in the scheme. And so I'm really grateful to everybody who's taken the time to take part in this and for the work that's gone into developing the approach. And we will certainly be wanting to learn from this and drawing from it for the for the main scheme. So thank you very much, everybody. I think this is really exciting. Great. And I know that you've been potentially looking at apps in the future, aren't you? And how DEFRA might um might use um apps yeah. going forward yeah and we really we, we want this all to be as straightforward as possible for farmers we don't want you to have what we're trying to do is get rid of pointless bureaucracy um and things that waste your time and and instead focus on things that are actually are useful to you to do as well as delivering the objectives that we want to see delivered for food and farming and the environment so we're very we're always interested in ways to do things more efficiently because um, yeah. when you do them more efficiently it's also more efficient for us on the whole so it's, it's a win-win situation really 
And in terms of people, there is some guidance on SFI um, 23. We've noticed that the guidance is sort of shortened. Are there going to be any how to guides on gov.uk or will you yeah. be, um, you know, what, what's your sort of next steps with that? Yeah, so we've published a document. I put a link to it in the chat earlier. Um, we published a document last week which sets out all the mandatory rules of SFI mm. in the new offer, but we will publish optional how-to guidance which for people to follow if they choose about how to do the things that are set out um, and we will do that before we open the scheme for applications which we're going to do from August onwards. Great one of the questions that while you're on before we sort of bring on the rest of the panelists in was that one of the questions was do you anticipate similar sorts of assessments being required on lowland commons or other areas in the future that was from Lindsay and I know she's in the new forest so we just wondered whether you'd think of a similar approach elsewhere. Yeah, we will certainly consider it. And one of the things we're looking at is how we can support those who want to do a sort of natural capital baseline type assessment um, in all areas of the country. And you can already do that. You can get funded to do that through the Resilience Fund, where you can have free business planning advice. And we're looking at whether the right thing to do is expand and evolve that offer or offer other options in SFI or CS. And there are, as you probably know, feasibility options and various other options available already in schemes. And we We've also been looking at whether we can usefully package those up together for people who are thinking about engaging with a scheme for the first time or moving on from a scheme they've been in for a long time to say, here's the mix of different assessments, feasibility studies, advice, et cetera, that you can get access to just to help like a starter pack to get going. So any thoughts on that from anybody on the call or who's participated in the test and trial or others, we're really keen to hear. Um, because it's all about trying to make the whole thing accessible and useful. And you can, of course, use those sorts of assessments, not just for government schemes, but to attract um, investment from private schemes and, and to take part in credit swap type initiatives, et cetera. So we, we're aware that this is something that lots of farmers are interested in. Great. Because um, we just we just mentioned that, I just noticed one of the questions was, will there be an approved list of apps? I mean, at the moment, there isn't, you haven't got that immediately planned, have you, or where? No, we haven't, but that is one model. So I worked in the NHS for a while and we did we had we did that there. We had an approved set of um, NHS type apps and they had to be accredited to meeting certain standards and then people could have confidence that they were sort of reasonable and not not terrible quackery. Um, and so I'm, I think that's an interesting model. Um, we're, we're interested in the sort of general, we're trying to support the whole system here rather than thinking if something needs doing, DEFRA should do it. So we're very up for linking out to other people's guidance, applications, training, et cetera. Um, whether we how you assure the quality of those and accredit them is a question that we haven't got into in great depth yet but is an important one because we don't want to refer people to something that isn't um up to scratch but we also don't want to introduce a massive barrier to entry and loads of bureaucracy around it that kind of slows down people's ability to access these things so that is a kind of useful question for us to ponder on and we're very much open to doing so Excellent, thank you. It'd be great now to have um, if other panelists would like to um, turn their videos on so that we can then look at some some questions and ask different people um, to answer those. So um, we've got a range of questions here. So um, one of the questions is um, what happens is um, Bridget Coles asked, um, what happens if a common is both SDA and Moorland? And, and uh, my understanding of this, uh, Bridget, is that you will have different field parcels. You'll have SDA parcels and you'll have Moorland parcels. So there is a new, um, the new low input grassland action. And that if that should be um, available on the, the SDA um, land. So that, that means that you can have the way you go on to rural payments as you go on and the different field parcels show up and it shows what's available, which which actions available on the different parcels. So you can mix and match. You get the commons payment as across the pay. The commons payment isn't just for moorland. It's across all land. Um, so am I correct in thinking that, Janet, that you can have a mix under one agreement, you have a mixture of different types? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, where where we are with that. Um, so uh, what does enforceable mean for internal agreements um, there? Um, so we'll, um, I know Viv, you were talking a bit about the internal agreement and we will, um, the, the enforceable means it's a contract that if someone breaks it, then you can, there's a, there's a sort of effectively a penalty so that you can uh, in, 
you can make sure that there's a you know, effectively a uh, a consequence um, for someone not complying with rules. And we've got quite a lot of clauses in the agreement to make sure that, for instance, if you don't comply with the terms of the agreement, then you, you don't get paid. Um, so that's that's the key. It's the way the contract works. Um, Viv, I don't know whether you want to add a little bit more about the discussions you've had and, and how you are structuring to the internal agreement, talking to brand commoners. Um. Well, I, I think actually in terms of the SSS, this SFI Moreland assessment, there is very little that um, people, I think you'd actually need to enforce really. I mean, there's things like if you don't attend a meeting, then you don't get paid anyway. Um, if the surveyors decide not to do their job, then they won't get paid and we'll have to find other surveyors. So it's not, I don't think it's that, um, there isn't a huge amount of conflict in, in delivering this um, a Moreland assessment, I think, but I might be wrong, time will tell. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful, Viv. So this is a, there are no land management actions mm -hmm. as to what Viv is saying. We should also add that this um, the internal agreement sits on top of any existing internal agreement you have. So it's been designed explicitly. So it's in addition to and doesn't conflict with your HLS internal agreement or your countryside stewardship internal agreement. What's really important is if you have an existing agreement for an HLS or CS, that is will not cover SFI. You have to have a separate SFI agreement. The reason we've made it fairly straightforward with and and. DEFRA uh, kindly contribute, you know, they they paid for the commissioning of this precedent. I should say it's not a DEFRA precedent, but it's um, uh, we've used some of the funding from the test and trial for this is because um, it's because there aren't now management actions. It's, it's it's quite possible to have a simple agreement, a three year contract, and it doesn't have to be a deed. If you're having a full CS agreement or HLS agreement, that's for 10 years and there are land management actions and those are always almost always signed as deeds and then you need to get a solicitor involved in the drafting of this but you can certainly while you need to adapt it to your local circumstance you can complete it yourself or with your land agent or other farm farming or conservation advisor and um, so that's um that the um dan or ben i don't know whether you'll be able to answer the question from um Tony Clark, who's asking about historic information and um, how, whether that can be added into the land app. Yeah, I'm happy to say that, Julia. Um, so thanks, Tony. Um, basically, on the land app, we host a number of templates. SFI is just one of them. So, for example, any historic ELS or HLS schemes or countryside stewardship schemes you can host on there. Plus, we host a load of data layers from different government agencies. Um, including some data from historic England. So you have overlays around designations, overlays about the registered battlefields and obviously the, the different common sites. In total, we've got about 90 different data layers. Um, I'd recommend probably just heading to our website, which is thelandapp.com, and we've got a full list of data layers and functions on there. Um, but happy to answer any more questions you might have. Yeah, people also as part of the SFI, you, you can get the shine data. So you get the, the data that you can ask for a particular data set. If you're already an HLS or CS, you will have that that list of data. They um, at the moment, we're not covering the sort of historic um, questions on this, um, but it's you can look up whether they're a local historic site or a scheduled ancient monument and and assess that. So that's something that we hope in, we might be able to add in to the survey question in due course if they happen to overlap, Dan. Yeah, well, interestingly, Historic England reached out yesterday to me and asked if we could in, you know, start to integrate some of the Shine data as well. So it's on it's on the horizon, but not quite accessible through the land app yet, Shine. Yeah, that's great. Well, that, that'd be really good if we can get to that. Um, so uh, what there's another question, Janet, if you're still um, available from Tim Cartmel, um, I think might be um, other people may want to contribute as well. But it, Tim has said under the SFI agreement with the RPA, will the RPA DEFRA have the right to see and use the results of, of your data stored on the land app? So we don't we don't have any there's no requirement for you to give us the data, except if we ask you to show it to us as evidence that you have actually done the work. So for that purpose, but we're not collating the data in general or for any other purpose. Um, and we're not 
I, I, I'm going to make an assumption about what's behind that question. We're not trying to kind of hold you to account as to whether you've made an improvement or not or any of those sorts of things using this data. The purpose of the assessment is for you to understand the condition of the moorland and identify what public goods it's producing and what further opportunities there are to do that. It's not it's not a data harvesting exercise for us. It's, for, it's intended to be helpful for you. We may in future schemes suggest that you use the um, to use the assessment to inform your plans and your actual substantive actions and you may choose to do that but there's nothing in the contract that says we that you've got to give us the data unless we ask you to do it to show to prove that you have actually done the action so an inspection of an inspector came round in the same way that you have to show invoices or record of works or anything that else is, you yeah. would they would come and look to see you've done it but they're not going to take your whole data set away with them and hand it over to to natural england or no you know. no that's yeah. not what it's for yeah. OK, uh, that's that's really helpful. I think it's important for people to understand that. And neither the Land Up nor the Foundation for Common Land are government agencies. And, you know, they're not your your data is your data. And that's when Tom, Tom talks about the terms and conditions. We make it very clear that. And Dan, I don't know whether you want to say anything about how you manage data in the Land Up. Yeah, uh, uh, happily. Uh, yeah, according to our user terms of service, all data that you create belongs to you, the end user. Um, the caveat to that is if you're within an organisation, the data belongs to the organisation itself. So if you become a subscriber within Land App and you create an organisation, that organisation then is the legal owner of that data. So it might be that the Common Association, for example, wants to create a subscription to then centralise the ownership of that data. Yeah. But that's yeah it's not a, you 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 can't hand it on to anyone else Correct. Yeah. excellent that that's really helpful um so, yeah, so i don't know if i could just make yeah, one quick point that popped up in the chat because i i saw that um ben uh gave me a heads up about this and i saw you already answered it uh in the chat but uh safety is a big big priority obviously with this so you can move the points uh we don't want anyone you know abseiling down to try and uh complete a point or risking their life so it's very simple to move the points uh, on the app you can do that outside of phone signal as well and it works um, and there is also an option uh, in the form to put that the whole 10 hectares is unsafe as well so yeah so yeah health and safety big big thing don't risk your life to uh, get get a survey data point please just can I just follow up with a quick point, probably just for Janet while you're here, is I think one big opportunity would be to open up the OS leisure base map to provide with surveyors, which is the orienteering map, which shows the access point, shows crossing, shows contour lines. Because at the moment, the freely accessible data doesn't include a lot of information that would make the surveying safe. So if DEFRA would be happy to have a conversation with us and OS, we'd be happy to facilitate providing that if there's a route forward. I'm very happy to have a conversation about that. I know there's been at least two decades of conversation about opening up um, ordnance survey data because I was once part of a the panel advising government on it how it was really important to do that so I don't want to put my foot in it with the kind of any uh, promises that I then can't keep but I'm certainly very happy to have a conversation about it that's great thank you very much really helpful um got now I've got a question from um Drew Butterfield about uh what happens if a landowner won't sign an agreement and um, as um, Viv's explained, the, there are um, all these schemes that in terms of the SFI Moreland assessment, you're just doing an assessment, you're not doing any land management actions, and you don't require um, people to, um, you know, anybody, anybody in particular, whether it's particular commoners or the owner, to sign up. So you're doing a survey, you're not taking away core samples of soil, uh, you're simply sticking a cane in the ground um you're you're assessing visually assessing the vegetation so if owners all owners are consulted and it may well be on some commons that either the owner or their keeper or manager um or ranger if it's a national trust common or a uu common they might well want to get involved and that's really um will be really welcome to have more people involved but the scheme can go ahead um even if people don't go ahead and and viv you might want to say a little bit about the involvement of owners or so far yeah i mean in in brant fell the owner wasn't involved i mean we wrote round to, we wrote to him he never responded and it's about giving the opportunity you know it's about demonstrating that you've actually let people know and it's up to them whether they want to respond or not because as julia says it, there's no land management actions it's just walking over the common you know common the crow act um it exists anyway so you've got public rights of access 
Um, and so surveying is doing, you know, it's not doing very much that the landowner should object to anyway. Yeah, so that, that's really helpful. I mean, you know, the owner in that particular case, he he's now involved, you know, there are other works going on and they're part of the survey. They're now looking at natural flood management and other things that are going on as part of our Upland Commons. So the owner is is involved in other ways, and but he just chose not to, to be involved in this particular um, project. And um, I don't know, Tracy, whether you'd like to comment. I mean, a lot of the um, the Dartmoors, there are um, a range of owners, but the Duchy has a large interest. Have, has there been any conversations about the role of owners with Dartmoor owners group yet? Um, no, um, for the trial on Peter Tavy, the um, Duchy who own it didn't want to um, take any payment. They said they wouldn't, you know, they wanted us to just get on with it and i apologize for not having my video on but i've still got real problems with my internet um so yeah that's the only owners we've spoken to um because they were the only relevant ones to um peter tavy but yeah they they definitely didn't want a payment to be part of this but they were happy for us to go ahead with it and offered any help if we needed it that's um thank you very much um, it's uh, Jim Bailey has asked how many people or percentage of rights are considered e needed for equal management control of the land, e.g. all most percentage. There, there isn't, again, this is, there isn't a percentage. So the important thing is you consult with everybody. So as Viv says, it's really important to put your life register together. Putting your life register together is really useful for other things. If you're ever doing any works on commons, you need to have an up-to-date register. If you're going to go into another scheme, into a, you know, an SF, a new, one of the newer, you know, the SFI options when they come out or countryside stewardship, you need to have all that data available. So it's a very good opportunity to update your data. But as far as SFI, more than stuff, if you wrote out to everybody and you can demonstrate that you have consulted with people, then and the people choose not to participate, it's totally up to them. Tom, I know on one common you've been working on the the common decided to put an ad in a in a newspaper to make sure that people felt consulted. Is that right? Yeah, they yeah they put a small uh, yeah ad in the local newspaper, just saying, letting people know that uh, what was going on and if you had rights, uh, then they to contact them basically. So they just felt that that gave them sort of extra coverage of making sure that they had given everyone a chance uh, to apply. Other commons haven't done that, but it's you know. It's completely up to you, really. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, well, there's a question here about assessing vegetation in winter compared to summer. I should stress the reason we did it in the winter was because that was the timing of our test and trial. So we were testing the process rather than testing, collecting the best possible data. Um, I don't know, Tracy, whether you'd like to. I know you do quite a lot of vegetation monitoring with the forest or maybe Colin. You know whether you you feel that there are better times when you for for assessing um, the vegetation. Yeah, well, it's definitely better doing it in the summer. Um, mm. You know, midwinter and all the rest of it, the vegetation, some of it's not there anyway. What you want to try and look at. So yeah, summertime would be the ideal opportunity to make make that assessment. Yeah, uh, and we've um, it is recommended by Defra that you try and do it at the same time each year. So you're, you know, so that it's again, it's this consistency that Viv mentioned. It's really good if you can get things as as consistent as possible. Um, so um, another question here from an anonymous attendee about what happens if graziers don't graze, will they be entitled to a payment? Um, again, you can have all. You can, in terms of the money's received, and you can pay the money to, in effect, you can pay the money to whoever you like, as long as you have an enforceable agreement. It's up to the association to decide how that money is split up. So you may well have non graziers who are involved in the common as well, and they are entitled to pay, particularly if they wanted to be involved in the surveying. The owner, they're usually not grazing and they're entitled to a payment. It's up to you as an association to decide how you split the money up. So it's about those who have a legal interest, not about those who, um, whether they graze or don't graze. And um, that's um, the um, the approach that's been taken. So the 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 three comments in the road testing decided to the people would have an SBI um, 
that means you doesn't that you, you can have an SBI and not be grazing as well, Viv. So maybe yeah. you know, that was the case with some people. Yeah, I mean, in, in yes, um, basically, because I mean, uh, as Julia said, you can you, you can be a grazier, grazier, be a surveyor, or not, and take the payment. You can um, want to join the S uh, join the um, SFI Moreland um, assessment and attend the meetings, and we have a payment for meetings. It's about showing interest, and there may be a little bit to distribute at the end. So you get payment for activity for doing things um, for, to, to contribute to the SFI. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're a grazier or non-grazier. Yeah, that, that's great. We've just got a couple of minutes left. There's one more question. I just wanted to check about the, the, the about the controlled road light. I know Kylie's kindly um, uh, answered some of it there. Janet, I just wonder, just in terms of this timing um, for the six months, I think you may be giving people six months notice for the terminating the agreement. So they're not likely to be going in straight in September. Could you say a little bit more about the termination of existing schemes? Yes, so for those in the introductory Moreland standard, the actions you're doing and the payments you're getting don't change when you move from one um, SFI mm -hmm. version to the other. Um, you will have been accumulating the management payment since January this year, and you'll get that as part of your closure payment when you move from one scheme to the next. And so you should move seamlessly and nothing should, there should be no impact on what you're actually doing or what you're getting paid or any of that. So that, that's the first sort of thing. It shouldn't be a material thing. It should be an administrative thing for you. Um, the, but it may be that in some circumstances that's not the case, in which case do get in touch with the RPA and say, what we've said in the letters to everybody who's got an existing agreement is we're contractually obliged to give you six months notice and that's what we're going to do. We're aware that some people might want to move into the new version of the scheme sooner than six months and we will get in touch with everybody, RPA will be in touch with everybody to advise on what the options are, whether you, whether you can do that and when exactly you can move across will depend on your particular individual circumstances and the nature of your agreement and, and those sorts of considerations. So RPA will be in touch with you all to make sure that you know exactly what's going to happen, what the options are. You can make sure you've got a seamless process and you move from one to the other as straightforwardly as possible. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. And there's someone's just asked about the 60 pence per hectare fee split. So that all goes to the Foundation for Common Land. And we have contracted with Land App to deliver the services. So we we pay, we've got a set fee. Um, we're a charity. All the money that we get in is used to um, uh, for our charitable purposes. So um, we are making the service available to non-common land. There's 800,000 hectares of moorland um, in England. 38% uh, of that is common land and 62% and, uh, isn't. So we're, we're neutral in terms of providing the service, we're neutral. We will be enhancing the development of the services. We obviously have to pay for the service um, and any um, any profit that's made is, is ploughed back into our charitable activities and developing our toolkit, developing more um, uh, you know, materials and undertaking activities on common and supporting all those with a legal interest in common to deliver more, but also for the public. So uh, we, we do quite a lot of work about uh, in, you know, informing policymakers, running training courses, and we will also be looking to develop more services, particularly around the ha farmer led habitat assessment so that farmers can have more informed conversations with Natural England around priority habitats and management of triple SIs. One thing we've just done is we've just commissioned uh, an opinion from a barrister around management of uh, triple SIs on Dartmoor. So there's a lot of work that we do um, within our, uh, and we're registered um, and you know, governed by charity commission rules. Um, we're now at nine o'clock, we've got a final poll and Susie, I don't know whether you'd be able to launch the final poll. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all our participants. Um, to um, to Colin, to Tracy, to Viv, to Ben, to Dan, to Tom, and to Janet. And Janet's come in at pretty short notice, and um, probably no, perhaps nobody else wanted to take this gig. But we're we're absolutely. I had my elbows out, and I stopped them all from coming, Julia, because I wanted <laughs> to come. Absolutely. Well, I hope you found it useful yourself, and. Um, yeah, so this question when asking people about undertaking the SFI, there are two questions. So the first question is how likely you, this is we've been asked to get this data by DEFRA as part of our test and trial. How likely are you to undertake SFI Moreland using pen paper and gov.uk guidance or 
um, how likely you are to undertake it if you were to have a digital surveying app and support. So please answer both questions um, so that we can get a feel for, um, uh, you know, and, and we are working with DEFRA and Natural England to seeking to improve the guidance and the feedback. One of the reasons DEFRA pay for the testing trials is so they get the feedback so that we have ongoing conversations with them and then we hope we'll get better guidance and as, as Janet says, maybe linking through to other resources available. We can maybe do another blog, Janet. We did a blog halfway through the test and trial and maybe that would be, you know, be surely be time to do another one. Yeah, great idea. Yeah. Let's do that. And we can have some nice screenshots and kind of exactly insights that have been generated. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending this evening. We will circulate a PDF of um, uh, slides um, and we will also um, there's the um, uh, we will also make sure that you have a link to the um, webinar, the recording of it. If you can always go on to YouTube and we've got a YouTube channel and we have lots of both our webinars, but also some really good common stories. So talking to people involved in the management of common land, lots of commoners, some of them get thousands of views. They're so exciting. Um, and uh, then we have um, uh, and those who are involved in managing common land as well from the owner's perspective. So we'd be um, do have a look there and we'll send you a link to that. So I th think we've now um, just leave that for a moment. I think most people perhaps who are going to answer that have answered that. And so shall we um, close that poll then and we can look at the results, Susie. And please do take a look on um, about, you know, at our toolkit. So we're uh, and we're going to have another webinar on the 31st of July about our other test and trial, which is about lowland commons and landscape recovery. So we'll be excited to tell you more about that. And then I think we've got another one in the middle of July about trees on commons too. So here we go, here are the results. So we'll just finish with that. We've got using gov.uk, we have 13% um, are highly likely to use it, the pen and paper approach, 23% possibly, 40% highly unlikely, and 23% um, not at all. Then we've got 68% um, highly likely with the app, 22% possibly, 8% highly unlikely, and 3% um, not at all. Um, so that may be they're not keen on the um, assess taking participating. That's absolutely fine. These are voluntary schemes, um, but that that's really encouraging to hear. And um, we'll be sending out the link if anybody wants to register for um, for using the app and getting going, um, whether you're moorland, um, whether you're common or non-common, that's um, available to you. Um, good. Well, I think we'll um, call it a day and apologise for running over a few minutes. Really good to have all your input and feedback. And please get in touch with us, um, either at info at foundationforcommonland.org.uk or at sfi at foundationforcommonland.org.uk. Um, thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, all. Take care.